Good evening. It's such an honor to be here and uh, to consider important topics about being strangers in a strange land uh, with you. Numerous topics that we'll cover over the next two days. My uh, topic is on the image of God and how theocentrism or God-centeredness shapes our public lives. I want to begin, though, by thinking with you about childhood. Many of us know that childhood can be a, a tough time. I think of the first time, for example, you go to some sort of school function, maybe a dance of some kind, and some of you will recall tremendous nervousness and anxiety uh, that made you feel like you were going to be struck down on the spot. There are all kinds of challenges and trials of childhood that we faced. And many of us can now say we passed through, we've gone to the other side, it's good to be an adult, we're thankful for that. One of the toughest parts about childhood, I think, is that kids can be cruel. We sometimes think of childhood as this age of innocence where everything goes perfectly and everybody's very nice and things are very gentle and tame. In reality, uh, human nature is fallen and many of us experience this in a personal way in our childhood. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and share a moment that was painful <laughs> from your childhood, though that would be interesting for me. Um, but but if, if I just say that to you, I'm guessing you're, you're thinking of something in your mind that was tough. Maybe that was tough for a very long time. In thinking on this theme, uh, I encountered a web link uh, to a story of a young boy who has had a tough childhood uh, unlike few that human history really has ever seen. This little boy's name is Adam Paulraj, P-A-U-L-R-A-J, Adam Paulraj. Adam is a unique little boy. He was born in India with severe physical defects, and his birth parents abandoned him. Many of us can think of uh, cruelty, as I say, in childhood, but few of us have tasted so directly the fruits of a fallen world as dear little Adam. In fact, some people in his village called him a curse. I think we may have an image of Adam to pull up at this point. This is Adam Paulraj. I don't usually do images in a talk, but I wanted to show you this little boy because I wanted you to see who had been called a living curse. His parents abandoned him, and let's just get right to it. Let's not play around. His parents abandoned him because he looked like this and they felt that this would shame them. They felt that this would effectively curse them the rest of their lives. But Adam's story does not end there. He's looking happy in this picture, thank you for showing it, because there was a Christian couple who chose not to call him a curse. They chose to call him a blessing. A couple named Raja and Jessica Paul Raj uh, heard about his story and adopted him, took him into their home. Even then, however, Adam's trials were not over. Doctors told this young couple, this Christian couple, who adopted him, that he could not possibly live long. He had many physical challenges. He's born with severe uh, deformities, including a cleft lip, cleft palate, no eyelids, no nose, fused legs, abnormal hands. He's diagnosed with Bartsosius pappus, a rare condition that is usually fatal. Brothers and sisters, let me say it this way. The world loves to pick winners and losers, okay? This is the kind of child that it called a loser from the very start. This is the kind of child, frankly, because of the way he looks, because of his physical challenges, that people around him saw and chose consciously not to think that he would have potential, that he would have a future, but said because of his looks, again, this boy he's never going to make it. Why not just abandon him, leave him by the wayside, so that we can get on with our lives and have a happy existence? There is one reason in the cosmos why somebody would adopt a, an abandoned little child like Adam Paul Raj, and it is the image of God. It is the image of God. Tonight, we consider the doctrine that, especially in an Old Testament, Old Covenantal sense, most shapes Christian public engagement with the world. If you've never heard much about the image of God, 
before this talk. I'm guessing you some have, but there's probably a spectrum in here. I hope that you will get ready because it is my prayer that looking at the image of God from a biblical perspective, a theological perspective tonight will help us to see that we do not have the option of choosing whether we will be salt and light in a fallen world. We, in fact, have the obligation, the glad obligation of plugging into our world as God-centered men and God-centered women. Turn with me in your Bibles tonight to Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. This is our foundational text that I will be drawing from in the moments that remain in this talk. Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds in the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. In what follows, I want to unfold six points that help us unpack what the image of God means. Many of us have heard this concept described. Some of us know that we are the image of God, but what practical import does this have for you and for me in a fallen world? So, six points that will consume the remainder of our time. First point tonight to consider. Theologically, to be the image of God implies the uniqueness of the human person. To be the image of God implies the uniqueness of the human person. Already from page one of the Bible, Humanity has nearly reached his theological height. He is the child of God. He is the representation of God. As Genesis 2 will go on to make clear, God's own hand forms mankind. God forms Adam from the dust of the earth, indicating a direct tie between his earthly creation and the man. From dust, the man is formed. And then the Lord goes on to create Eve from a a rib of Adam, indicating a symbiotic, unitive relationship between the man and the woman that will allow no abuse, no unkindness, no wickedness to creep in. There's There's a directness of creation. There's a physicality to creation already from page one of the Bible. Already, mankind is an enchanted being from page one of the Bible. Secular materialism, which would tell us that we are simply a clump of cells. We have simply resulted from years and years, eons and eons of uh, mindless development that has resulted with us. This accounts for who we are, and thus we can't really think of ourselves as creatures that are distinct from the earth. We are much like pigs. We are much like squirrels. We are much like any animal out there. We just happen to be able to talk about who we are. The Bible says no from the start. The biblical worldview holds out humanity as, again, enchanted. I want to make sure that you understand that word because that is crucial for understanding who in God's mind we are. We have almost super value. We are very near to super beings as human beings. To think of what the human person can achieve is breathtaking. Think of the great works of culture, of art, of literature, of architecture, and beyond. The human being can accomplish amazing things, and it is all because of God's special creation of humanity. We are not like the animals in that uh, we do not uh, have the special endowment of God on us. We have been chosen by God as men and as women to stand out. In the ancient Near East, kings, when traveling, would often leave a little statue of themselves that would represent their reign. And they would call this statue the image. This was their image. And I think Moses is probably picking up off of this under the inspiration and guidance of the Holy Spirit in labeling, through the words of Yahweh, mankind, the image 
of God. We are the ones that God has left on the earth to be his little factotum, his little statue. People are supposed to look at us, much like the ancient king who's on a trip and think, the king may be away, but he is coming back. That is what you and I are. That is what every human being is as an image bearer. All of this means, furthermore, that as Christians, we cannot only advocate for impressive men and women. We do not believe that only the most gifted and talented have value. We believe as Christians that everybody has value. You don't have to earn your status You don't have to gin up value. You naturally have immense worth, value, and dignity as the image of God. Every single person, full stop from the start. This is an astonishing claim in theological terms, in worldview terms. And and the body is a crucial part of this involvement with our surroundings. You see, the image of God preloads us both with value and for public engagement. We are those who have something to contribute. God has formed us. God has made us. God has endowed us with rationality. God has endowed us with awareness. Your average salamander does not write a memorial, right, when its life is drawing near to its close. Uh, There is no such book that you will find out there. There is no squirrel that will begin a talk show to, to consider squirrel problems, right? This is only something that that human beings have the opportunity to undergo. So we have value. We are called, I think, into community by virtue of being the image of God, and we are those who are called to involve ourselves in this world. And as I say, the body is a crucial part of this involvement. We are embodied creatures. We do not hover off the ground uh, a foot to two feet. We are embodied creatures. It's not a ghostly mirage who is the image of God. God doesn't say to one of his angelic beings even, you are the image, you are my likeness. God says this to you and to me, embodied creatures. What does this say about the body? What does this say about what it means to be the image of God? Much of the advocacy in politics, in the public square of the believer draws from this reality that our bodies are under attack, or rather, that we have in Adam, as we see in Genesis 3, enslaved ourselves to bodily lusts. And a key portion of our sin, our self-lust, is self-worship. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel has noted that the Hebrew word selim, which means image, you can find it there in Genesis 1, is used in the Torah both to condemn the worship of man-made images, and to respect all humans as divinely created images of God. So you could say it like this, mankind, the image, the selim is not, in the Hebrew, is not to make more selims. We are the selim. We are the image. You will know, many of you, that there is a profound problem in the Old Testament among Israel with self-worship and with idolatry. (laughs) <laughs> the, the crucial critique against idolatry is, is loaded already into Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Mankind is the image of God. So he is, by virtue of this, not to set up little images and bow down to them. He's not to bow down to himself, but he is to see in himself a pointer to Yahweh, to God himself. So too, along with the body, is the creation a key part of our broader work. The creation, we learn in Genesis uh, 2, is subject to us. We are not subject to the creation. The human person is vice-regent in theological language, vice-regent. We are sub-kings over all that is. God is the ultimate king, so we do not truly reign and rule over this sphere. Only God does. But yet, God has appointed the man and the woman to rule over the creation, to subdue it, to have dominion over it. And so, all of this means that we engage the creation as a key part of our broader work. In other words, we are not to cut ourselves off 
from the creation we learn already in Genesis 1. We are to be right here and right now. Some of you have heard of the desert fathers and mothers of the early church. They would withdraw from society, from sinful, tainted society, to go and meditate and pray and lead an an ascetic existence. And though there is good in doing such things, and especially good in, in a kind of spiritual retreat, I think, at times, that is not the fundamental calling of the image of God. The image of God has this interconnection to creation. We can't leave the creation We're called to rule over it. We're called to subdue it. So already there is a summons to have our feet on the ground, to find ourselves in this strange world and to not turn our back on it. Now, as uh, as you will know, this this language and this uh, relationship does not hold. The fall of Genesis 3, 1 through 7, involves a very reversal of roles with the creeping thing taking dominion of the woman and the man failing to protect and lead his wife. So just after God in Genesis chapter 2 has instituted a proper relationship in the creation with the man being the leader of his wife and the wife being called to be a helper to him, a a charge that is never given to the man to his wife, uh, just after this, we see the complete undoing of divine authority. God has called the man and the woman both, to rule over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You saw that in Genesis 1 in the passage I read. And yet the creeping thing, right, Satan, has assumed authority over the man and the woman. And in turn, the man has not assumed his role of leadership, of protection, what the New Testament will call headship. The man has abdicated this role, leaving his wife to her lonesome, and thus they eat of the forbidden fruit and are alike considered guilty, totally guilty before God. All of this shows us that the image is a crucial doctrine. The image is not lost in this fall that I have just described, but there is a fracturing of the image. Nonetheless, nonetheless, we continue to hold out as believers the image of God as our core understanding biblically of humanity, our first major theological concept that helps us understand what it means to be human. You will know that our society and culture is engaged in a massive debate about what it means to be human. This is the central question of the age. Most people around you at your workplace, in your school, are not puzzling over the intricacies of Christology. I I would love for that to be the case, but that simply is not reality. What many people today are thinking a great deal about is what it means to be human. And you hear a whole vocabulary of what it means to be human, for example, when you hear people talk oftentimes about sex and their sexual preferences. You hear this, for example, when people will say that they have found their true identity. They have come out, and now they know who they are. They're they're free to be who they truly were made to be. That is a theological claim at core. And it is telling us when we're hearing this, I have found what it truly means to be human. What you and I have to say is this. Sex is a good gift of God, but God has established what humanity is already. We are, we are theocentric beings. That's what we're made to be. We're made to be God-centered. We're not made to be soulless, materialistic, engaging in our lusts, enslaved to our bodily appetites. We are made, we are made to be like Icarus and to soar, to soar up to the sun. And yet in our fallenness, we know that our wings will indeed melt and we will fall to the ground. No other religion or worldview contributes such an exalted conception of humanity from the beginning. Think with me just very quickly as we conclude this point, this first point, about various belief systems and their understanding of humanity. Hinduism teaches the caste society. Some are better than others, you will know in this worldview. Racism or nativism, which is an issue today in in the American public square, tells us one color or group of people is actually actually superior, excuse me, to others. Some are better than others based on their skin color. Sadly, this is written into the fabric of America uh, to our national shame, our historical shame. Communism, another worldview, ends up telling us 
that some pigs, to use the language of George Orwell, are more equal than others. So there's supposed to be this lifting up, right, of the working class. You remember this from like high school government class reaching way back? Yes, okay, some of us. Communism tells us that, that the working class is supposed to eventually rule all things in a kind of utopia as it owns the means of production and then gives way to this kind of secular paradise. But in reality, as many of you will know from your study of the 20th century, uh, in truth, communism ends up creating a very tiny elite that rules over the working class. And communism, of course, is behind uh, tens of millions of deaths in the 20th century, being the bloodiest, bloodiest century, excuse me, in human history. I was talking with a cab driver on my way to this conference, and he raised with me the familiar argument against religion that religion causes violence. Raise your hand if you have heard this argument from a skeptic somewhere, sometime. Okay, a super common argument, right? Some of us who are in secular settings, uh, who, who engage the workplace or a university environment, perhaps, you will hear this sort of thing. Know that, just quickly, historically, it is godlessness in the 20th century that accounts for vastly more human deaths than any war of religion. Chairman Mao is responsible and his henchmen in communist China in the 20th century for about 70 million deaths alone. We talk a lot about Hitler, who was prodigious at ethnic cleansing. Chairman Mao, his, his uh, accomplishments in terms of killing his fellow humankind boggles the mind. So, so we need to push back, don't we, against poor thinking and bad arguments. And you don't need to have a PhD, an MDiv, or some sort of higher equipment uh, with a degree to be able to do this. You simply need to know some basic facts and you need to know that though religion has uh, committed some major flaws, and though radical Islam is definitely a global threat, though Christians have taken up the sword in the past at times, the Crusades and other times, suffice it to say that godlessness, atheism, agnosticism has accounted for far more human suffering and death than any religion you can name. Fascism, another worldview that has a view of humanity, right, leads to the state looming over the individual. Elitism, which is not nearly so successful at the formal level, but elitism, which is present in American life, by the way. I'm from New England, and New England elites pride themselves on their excellent education. When I flew back with my fiance to New England, I told her that within 20 seconds, we would hear where our seatmate on the plane went to college. Sure enough, it was Dartmouth, just like that, uh, within 20 seconds. <laughs> elitism informally enshrines a kind of caste system. You ever think about this? If you go to you know, the, the Ivy Leagues or something like this, you really kind of have it made and you deserve to run the country. Just kind of hope you know that. Uh, the rest of you hoi polloi out there, you can have, you know, a house and that sort of thing, a, a dog, pet him on the head uh, before you go to work, but we're going to kind of run things. Uh, elitism is as much an ascendant ideology in our day as is any, and it's interesting to compare that system of thought with the American founding, which is decidedly anti-elitist in many directions. Progressivism. Leftist progressivism unwittingly seeks to make the lower classes the elites. Uh, not all are equal. Some of you saw this with the 99% movement against the 1%, right? That has a vision of humanity at its base, doesn't it? It's saying that the 1% deserve to be demonized and deserve to be displaced in society. That's a vision of humanity. It's, it's essentially more virtuous not to have money. Postmodernism, we see this in many films, Artworks today tells us that man is a noble but tragic figure, essentially doomed uh, to destruction, and we just sort of try to muddle our way through. It's a close cousin to existentialism, French philosophy, which some of you in this room uh, saw as, as a major worldview threat in uh, decades past. Existentialism tells us that essentially we create our own meaning with acts of radical individualism. And that's the only way we can find meaning. Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, said this uh, in years past, I emerge alone as a result of his study of himself and in dread in the face of the unique and first project which constitutes my being. All the barriers, all the railings collapse, annihilated 
by the consciousness of my liberty. I have not, nor can I have, recourse to any value against the fact, listen to this, that it is I who maintains value in being. I have to realize the meaning of the world and my essence. I decide it alone, unjustifiable and without excuse. That is the voice of existentialism speaking. This is a very commonly held philosophy among thinkers today. Though they might not, they might not trace it back all the way to Sartre or others, nonetheless, this idea that you create meaning, your own meaning, you create your own value, you undertake the great uh, project of self-construction, the identity of the self, all this is related to this kind of thinking. Nihilism, another worldview, tells us that to be human is essentially to destroy, just to strike down. Wherever you see institutions that seem to give off happiness, the family, the church, uh, the home, uh, broader civil society, torch them, set them ablaze, free these stupid people from their enslavement to thinking that there's a greater purpose in the world. These are these are real, these are real visions, okay? We're in, the, we're in one of the most abortive-minded societies in human history. We think that we are the first world. We live as the third world, don't we? We abort millions of children. We've aborted tens and tens of millions of little babies, defenseless babies in the womb. We think we are the high and mighty and advanced, and we are barbarians because of worldviews like this that have won. They've won over the hearts and minds of many. Epicureanism tells us that we are human when we live selfishly and we do whatever we want. There's really no answer in Epicureanism, as many of you will know, to the problem of evil, to suffering, to these sorts of things. It's simply eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Okay, with this little survey concluded, I just want you to see, theologically, Christianity alone gives ultimate meaning to the human person. Do you feel this? You should feel the horsepower, the 600 uh, horsepower engine of Christian theology coursing through you as we talk about the image of God. This is a reason to live. This is a reason to move and have your being in this world. This is a reason to get involved in the public square. This is a reason to show up at the crisis pregnancy center. This is a reason to reach out to your neighbor who for some reason has not come out uh, of their, their doors in, in days and is seemingly uh, letting themselves fall to the wayside in these and a thousand other ways. We find in the image of God our theological uniqueness. Secondly, philosophically, the image of God implies solidarity with the broader group, with humanity. The image of God philosophically implies solidarity with the broader group. In other words, we're all humanity, right? And we're all the image of God. Now, you remember the, the gifted and talented program in grade school? You remember that? It was kind of isolating, wasn't it? I mean, everybody who wasn't in the gifted and talented program yearned to be in it and resented those who were in it. And everybody who was in it felt like they were a sort of super class in the elementary school. Well, suffice it to say that in the Christian worldview in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, there is no gifted and talented program. It's not one person, in other words, who is especially the image of God. There are no indispensable men in Christianity. There is nobody you're supposed to look at and think, that's the one we really need to lead the charge in the church. The, the graveyards are filled with indispensable people, aren't they? This is a rebuke. This is a rebuke to recognize us, that we're all the image of God, all of us. This is a rebuke to the disnified super specialness of the age. Everybody getting a trophy. Now you go to award ceremonies, you know, for like a four-week ballet program, and it takes an hour and a half or something like this, because they all need, you know, a personal, you know, writ of certification as a four-year-old ballerina. <laughs> this is the kind of society we find ourselves in. Everybody gets a trophy. Well, the image of God simultaneously rebukes that spirit, but also gives us something better in terms of our meaning and worth, doesn't it? Because it tells us our meaning and worth aren't found in being recognized by our peers as exceptional. 
you know, something like 90% now of young millennials rate themselves as way above average. There's <laughs> a statistical problem there that I will <laughs> leave it to you to sort out. Anyway, we recognize that we don't need the approval of mankind to know that we have this dignity and worth. But we also see beyond this that we're made for community. We are a community of image bearers from the start, aren't we? We're made, we're made for the true community. Every human being is not made for, for this worldly community. We're made for the society of God. Heaven is a world of love, Jonathan Edwards famously said. We're made for that world. That's what your brain is for. That's what your heart is for. That's what your soul is for. It's to be in heaven, ultimately. It's to be in the new heavens and the new earth, ruling with God, freed from your imperfections, sins, and flaws. So we are not lone agents. We're not. We cannot allow ourselves to be individuated. In other words, to see ourselves as isolated from one another. For the Christian, the doctrine of the image of God couples with The doctrine of the second greatest commandment, neighbor love, as it's called. Love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 22, 37. And this together means that we are in community, in humanity. I don't mean this in the kumbaya sense. I mean this in a much thicker, deeper sense. Practically, this means, hear me very clearly, that we love people. We we love people. Every Christian loves people, whether you are a sap who cries at that video that somebody sends you of a little laughing baby, or whether you're frankly a little bit grumpy, okay? (laughs) You are called, as a Christian by virtue, philosophically of the image of God, to find yourself in the community of the image bearers and to love people. Does that not have import for Christian public life, for public square engagement? We love people. We're not in this. We're not in this to win culture wars, ultimately, We're not in this to impose our views on those who disagree with us. We shouldn't be. We are in this out of neighbor love because our neighbor bears, Genesis 1, the image of God. So we love society. We are those who actually care the most about humanity. So it should be in every local church all over the world without exception. We care the most about disabled children. We care the most about them, don't we? We see somebody, seriously, we see somebody in the cafeteria or whatever who's eating alone. We see somebody who's socially awkward. We see somebody who, you know, stands out for the wrong reasons. We are those who do not leave them. We're the ones who befriend them. Why? The image of God as a baseline. I haven't jumped to the gospel yet. The image of God as the baseline. We are, we are those who care the most about unborn babies, Christians evangelical Christians, born-again Christians. Our Catholic friends have shamed us in this area. I, uh, for several years, was able to go to a, the, the abortion clinic in Louisville, Kentucky, where I previously taught, and there would typically be one or two evangelicals, and I didn't go often, so I'm not up here to give myself a badge, but there typically would be one or two evangelicals and maybe six to eight Catholics. And this is not, again, this is not about Catholics versus evangelicals. That's not what it's about. But it is to say evangelicals who love the Bible and who love these doctrines should be the ones who show up and speak up in love on behalf of the weakest among us. We care the most about gays and lesbians. It should never be the case that gays and lesbians would feel more loved by fellow gays and lesbians than by Christians. Now, of course, their understanding of that experience will be colored by virtue of the fact that the Bible always, in every case, regards homosexuality as a sin. Okay? So, please hear me clearly. That's a, that's a hard one to get around, ultimately, right? That, that is a truth that we are supposed to preach such, a, such that they will come to repentance, just as we must come to repentance, just as sinners of every kind, of every lust, must come to repentance. Nonetheless, if you have a gay or lesbian neighbor, okay, in your community, you don't want to shut yourself off from them. You want to love them. If there is a transgender person in your neighborhood, you don't want to flee from them. You want to love them. 
You want them to see the light of Christ in you. You want them to know that they are a fellow image bearer. You have more reason, every Christian in here, theologically and biblically, to love sinners than sinners do. Is this how we act? Is this how we behave? We must. We are called to this. We care the most about outcasts and the homeless. Do you know that you are called to love your enemy? You're called to love your enemy because of the image of God. Matthew 5 44, I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You're not called to snipe at your enemy. You can, you can oppose falsehood, to be sure. You should. You must, actually, as a Christian. But you are called to love your enemy, not to snipe at them, not to poke fun at them, not to demean them, not to take up their tools and strike them down. All humanity, then, is placed into society from the very start. We do not need to consciously make social contracts as the Enlightenment philosopher Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau famously said. We don't have to enter into contracts to establish a basis for human interaction. We already have that basis by virtue of being the image of God. In order, in order to recognize these truths, we need pastors who preach truth about humanity. The pastor is far, far more important to a flourishing society than any rising political star. Even today, we are hearing that America needs a revival. It needs a kind of uh, theologically infused public movement. You know what America desperately needs most of all? Gospel-loving churches. And if it is to have people who love Christ and love His Word, it must have pastors who stand and declare boldly, unapologetically, without moving the biblical mark an inch, the full counsel of God. Think about this. Behind the free market of Geneva in the 16th century, Reformation Geneva, was was the pulpit of John Calvin. Behind the world-defying political advocacy of William Wilberforce in 18th century, 19th century England was the sin-targeting preaching of the former slave trader John Newton. Behind the abolitionist activity of 19th century New England, the new divinity, the followers of Edwards as they are called, was the worldview of Jonathan Edwards. Behind the Hitler defying witness, just about the only person in Nazi Germany who would stand up to Hitler, was the courageous pulpit ministry of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Behind the modern adoption movement, uh, which I know this church is a part of, other churches I'm sure in the city are a part of, is evangelical love of preaching, is, is preaching that understands and is grounded in the image of God. So, brothers and sisters, every Christian is called to make good on the image in society, but we must have churches, we must have pastors who equip us to do this meaningfully important work. Number three, personally, the image of God tells us that we have an identity. We don't have to construct one. This is, as I said earlier, the great project of 21st century life, to create your identity. Some of you will know that Facebook has over 50 gender options now, okay? Um, There are all sorts of new and exotic identities that you can choose. There's even uh, the identity of, I think it's called diamondism or something like this, where if you feel like you are a kind of magical little cat in terms of your identity, you can own that. That's how you can identify. It's a real thing. I'm not making this up. What I'm here to say is the image of God means that we don't have to make up our identity. You are freed from the great modern project. Young people, teenagers, college students, your worth and dignity and identity has been defined already. You don't need to be recognized by your peers in any given way. You don't need to stand out as cool or something like this. Uh, You don't need to be seen as, I don't know, the most tolerant or progressive or something like this in your class. You simply need to know who you are in God. God has made you his image. Listen to me. Listen to me. You are freed from image maintenance as a Christian. Every age, every person in here, you don't have to worry about what people think about you. You don't have to fear man. In fact, you must not. In fact, you sin against God if you do because God has told you who you are. You are his likeness. You are called to rule over the earth under him. You're called to subdue the earth. You're called to have dominion. This is who you are. This relates, this relates to political 
causes. So many people try to find their identity, actually, not just in peer approval, but in political causes. You know this, right? Social causes, social justice is everywhere. Social justice warriors is a big thing on Twitter among college students today. The historian Richard Hofstadter in the 1960s famously decried politics in the paranoid style, uh, a, an article and a book that would be picked up endlessly by uh, the New York Times, the Atlantic, these kind of outlets, whenever they need a kind of hook by which to decry what evangelicals are doing. Christians can fall prey to paranoia. You and I can. It is true. But few are more tempted to be paranoid than those who have no God but this world. That's when you're truly paranoid. Nothing is more moralistic, more anxious, more this-worldly than to have a political cause without anything ultimate behind it. I think recently of the actor Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, he won the Academy Award, as you will know, ending a long-time drought and used his acceptance speech, apparently that's funny, um, to decry global warming, which may or may not be happening. And uh, some folks pointed out that Leonardo DiCaprio has recently, and in many cases, rented the fifth largest yacht in the world, which uh, accounts for a few of those little things that may be puncturing the atmosphere. At any rate, you see how easy it is, don't you, to become moralistic and anxious while at the same time recognizing that there is a log in your own eye. Christians can fall prey to this, but we must recognize that we are those who do not live here. God's cause is our cause. We don't have to search for an identity. It has been given us. Fourth, economically, the image drives us toward meaningful work and thus meaningful public involvement in our world. Christians haven't always talked a lot about work. But Genesis 1.28 tells us this. God says to, to mankind, the first man, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the creation. So as Christians, we continue to pursue this dominion mandate, as theologians and exegetes call it. Now, we shouldn't only reduce Genesis 1.28 and its fulfillment to work, you know, a nine to five or something. A major part of the fulfillment of this mandate. The dominion mandate is to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. So building families is actually world-changing work. Some of you will know that there's this famous saying that everybody wants to lead the revolution, but nobody wants to do the dishes. Yes? We are those who recognize that the small things, the familial life, building a happy marriage, as Andrew will talk more about tomorrow, raising children, not like society raises them, where you essentially shunt them off to various activities so that you don't have to engage them. No, we recognize that the small things are glorious things. There is honor. There is eternity. There is eternity in the small things, isn't there? There's eternity in being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. This also means, though, that we do have dominion over the world by virtue of our vocation. We may not fulfill this in an agricultural sense, but you are called to overcome the chaos of this world. And you are likely already doing this, whether or not you realize the extent to which you are. You're called to tame a spreadsheet. That can be hard work for some of us. Every time you figure out a new pipe fitting, you're taming chaos. When you are nurturing a child, the most important work in this world there is, you're taming chaos, especially if it's a little boy. <laughs> I have a four-year-old boy. I speak from experience. Uh, when you figure out a better batting stance, if you're a baseball coach, taming chaos, beautiful stuff. When you create a sermon, when you found a social media company, 10,000 other ways to tame the chaos of this world, to have dominion over it. Genesis 1, that's you being an image bearer. That is you honoring the Lord and glorifying Him. Let me say it this way. The sanctity of the human person has shaped so much of Western society, this concept we find in Genesis 1, 28. The sanctity of the human person fuels the valuing of every person. This concept creates great respect for every person. This concept syncs with things like individual property rights, interestingly. You will know that it is very hard to have a society, by the way, without individual property rights. We should be thankful for them. None of this is directly political. Free market exchange is not directly political. It's an outworking, I think, of 
uh, bearing the image of God. But all of these endeavors speak to a rich public square engagement on the part of the creation. We recognize as believers, fundamentally, that secularism seeks to level things, whereas Christianity builds cathedrals. I think of Chairman Mao, who I mentioned earlier. Chairman Mao, when he was really in power in China, tried essentially to destroy all the beautiful landmarks of Chinese culture, and he succeeded to a great extent, by the way. Christianity has the opposite impulse. We are not godless. We are not atheistic. We are not motivated only by ourselves and only by human power. We want to build cathedrals, not just the actual cathedrals, but we want to build cathedrals metaphorically every day in our lives. That is what the image of God summons us to do. Fifth, societally, the image of God means that we must love our neighbors as ourselves. This is where the call to the public square comes, I think, from um, Genesis 1. If we sync it in particular, as I said, with Matthew 22, 37, the, the second greatest commandment to love our neighbor as our self. We have rich grounds through these two teachings for action in the world. And this is true at the highest levels, but this is also true at the most granular level, political engagement. What I'm trying to say is the image of God calls you into community, as I said already, but I'm trying to extend this and say this calls you actually into political activity as a church. I don't mean that the church is a pack. I don't mean that this is what the, the pulpit is fundamentally about. I do mean that this is the outworking of the gospel in your heart, that you would be involved in this world because you love fellow image bearers. Chuck Colson, who uh, I have written a book about, uh, used to say this, Christians need to be against the world for the world. In other words, this is an evil world. We have to stand against evil, but we're not simply trying to defeat evil. We're trying to love our neighbor. This is what we are called to societally. This is why, brothers and sisters, you, you better be voting. This is why even you should consider advocacy for good candidates, for example, uh, good laws. That is not losing your soul to politics. You do it carefully. You do it recognizing that this is the outworking of a gospel claim on your public life. But I think nonetheless, carefully, within bounds, with counsel from pastors and elders, we do plug in as salt and light, what Ryan talked about in the introduction. Lastly, morally, the image of God means that we cannot make up our own way of being. We don't make our own morality like folks around us. Did you know this? We inherit morality. You don't play moral buffet as a Christian. You don't choose exactly what to believe on moral and ethical issues. Of course, you have to think hard about those that aren't directly answered in Scripture. I fully affirm that. But there are many issues on which you simply watch as a fully formed moral, ethical worldview descends upon you, and you are called to live that out. You are called to advocate for human dignity. You are called to stand for the, the world-shaking reality that every being has vitality, meaning, worth, and dignity. The image and the gospel create ethics in us. We are made by Christ the true culture. This secular world is not true. It's false. It's a shadow. It's passing away. This world has already been claimed by God. We are the true culture that will live forever into all the ages and beyond. This helps us understand public and political engagement, doesn't it? We don't lose our soul here and now. We engage in our world, but not as those who recognize that this is the true place. This is not the true place. This is not our true home in a Hebrews 11 sense. Sometimes people denounce evangelicals for doing culture war. But that term is not too strong for what Christians are actually engaged in. It's too weak. We're engaged in cosmos war. There is a massive struggle taking place between Jesus Christ and the whore of Babylon. There is a tremendous conflict raging all around us for souls. And, and the beast uh, in Revelation, who is Satan, seeks to devour 
seeks to devour the child that God would produce, the church. And we must recognize this speaks to not a culture war, but a cosmos war. It's far worse than people think for Christians. We think that there's a war raging not just in political elections. We think that all around us, Satan would seek in ways big and small, announced and unannounced, to enslave souls and consign them to eternal damnation. The true battle between uh, forces in this world is not left and right. It's between Satan and Jesus. And, and the representation of these two in this world is between paganism and Christianity. Paganism is a real live force. Many people who operate by a pagan worldview don't know that they do, but paganism reduces everything to one. It blurs all distinctions. It exalts our bodily lusts. It asserts the rule of the stronger over the lesser. It divinizes the created order. In other words, it destroys all that we have been at pains, even in this brief session, to lay out. There's a battle going on in America between paganism and Christianity that's much larger than left and right. Paganism is the force whispering in the ear of those who are telling us there are no distinctions, for example, between the sexes, that it is a good thing that a little boy who believes he is transgender would enter the little girl's room, the way society is going. That's ultimately a pagan view when you really trace it back. The voice of paganism is voiced by Goethe's Mephistopheles. In the German, Mephistopheles says this, Ich bin der Geist, der stets verneint. Loosely translated by the philosopher Roger Scruton, I am the spirit who always denies, the one who reduces something to nothing and who thereby undoes the work of creation. All that God has esteemed, all that God has loaded with dignity and worth, there is a force in this world that wants to destroy. This is why there is such surging interest in a secularizing culture for abortion. It's not by accident. It's because there is a force in this world that seeks to tear apart limb from limb all that exists, all that breathes, all that God has created. So, brothers and sisters, you and I morally are called to stand against this spirit. The conflict is much larger than any political battle. I want to conclude with this. Christians have always been meaningful parts of the public order of the public square. They have been so because we have to fulfill the dominion mandate of Genesis 1. We also have a greater mandate, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. We have the call to take spiritual dominion and not simply physical and cultural dominion of the earth. We're called to make disciples, in other words. So there's, a, there's an initial call, and then there's the fulfillment of this call in the New Testament. I can't spell this out at length, but suffice it to say, we work from the standpoint of both the image of God and then the gospel of Jesus Christ, and both call us into the public square. I am reminded in concluding of how Christians reacted in AD 260 when plagues, terrible plagues broke out in the city of Rome. Over 5,000 people died a day in Rome, according to historian Rodney Stark and others. One Christian of this era said this about the plagues in this period. Dionysius said, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another, heedless of danger. They took charge of the sick, attending to their every need, ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life. They died, he's saying. Many Christians died, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors, and cheerfully accepting their pains. Brothers and sisters, what can create that kind of love? Other Romans, well-born Romans, when plagues broke out in this period and other periods, fled to the hills. They left the city. What did Christians do? They went into the city. They went into the city when the banner of death was hanging over it. They were essentially issuing themselves a death sentence. Why do that? Because of the image of God. Why should you and I, the city of God, enter once more into the city of man, the image of God, and the grace of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are things that are too great for us 
none of us can live out what your word challenges us to do and what I have feebly attempted to call for in this brief talk, Lord, but help us, help your church to swell with hope grounded in Jesus Christ and fueled by a love for fellow human beings made in the image of God. Cause us, even in this polarized, divisive, disappointed, disheartening age when political conflict is everywhere around us, when we cannot escape it, help us once more as the city of God to plunge into the city of man. And if necessary, if necessary, lay down our very lives for it. In the name of Christ, amen.